to lead without limits creating a digital future with tech talent and culture powered by moneycontrol.com and Coursera a global online learning platform lead without limits is a campaign comprising of a series of roundtable discussions with industry leaders and visionaries it focuses on delivering better consumer experiences driven by new age emerging technologies so as business leaders across domains accelerate their technology spends the question remains how can organizations realign themselves to stay agile and future ready and also create the same platform between talent, tech, transformation and culture? And that is the focus of today's discussion. In this discussion, we will be focusing on the BFSI sector and how can it effectively scale up the digital operations and herald a new era of innovation. So today we have with us leading industry experts from the financial ecosystem. And let me begin by introducing them. We have with us Mr. Ankur Varshney, Deputy Chief Technology Officer, IDBI Bank. Mr. Swami Subramaniam, Chief People Officer, Fullerton India. Mr. Riaz Ladiwala, SEVP and Head Technology and Operations, Edelweiss Financial Services Limited. And Mr. Dallas Krishnan, MD, Coursera Enterprise, India and ANZ. Hi, everyone, and hello to you, Rujia. Great. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining in today on this very special discussion. And as I mentioned earlier, we would be exploring the challenges and the opportunities that are uh, in front of us, where we can also upskill the workforce to play a stronger role in an organization's digital transformation journey. So, uh, Mr. Ankur, I'd like to begin with you. Let's talk about the rapid pace of digital transformation. What are the top trends that you have seen in the past few years, especially since the onset of the pandemic? that have redefined the industry? Last three years uh, have had been full of learning uh, in the pandemic, with the pandemic and post pandemic. And uh, the predominantly what we have learned is our systems, our processes should be available for everyone, every time on the clock. Uh, to make that happen, it requires uh, a lot of uh, re engineering, a lot of introspection or introspection to mm -hmm. our landscape of uh, systems, processes, and the applications. It, it required redefinition of uh, so many things how we deploy the things, how we deploy the applications, how we manage the uh, processes, the release, the new features the critical production fixes. Uh, so in a nutshell, it, it is all encompassing. The, the one thing which we learned the hard way was the uh, how to manage the show with uh, less uh, resources. Uh, right. Because as we, um, as we were subjected to the pandemic, our resource pool, uh, I mean, they were like uh, one cut to one third, one fourth, and it many in many cases because of the government and regulatory pressures we had to uh, roll out features in a nip of time so all that required a lot of uh, rework so uh, there was no room for laxation i would say uh, not to uh, mean that word in a, in a derogatory sense but then uh, some things which were taken for granted because we have uh, ample time we had full days, uh, we had full strength of uh, resources, which was kind of cut off, uh, in, especially in the pandemic. So that was the learning uh, made that nothing could be taken for granted. At the same time, the, the show must go on. So that was the biggest learning for me. Definitely. And the financial ecosystem has, as you mentioned, totally transformed. And we've learned a lot during the pandemic. Um, coming to you, uh, yeah. Mr. Riyaz, what has been uh, your learning in this period? How have you evolved as an organization? And what are the game-changing technologies that you feel have the potential to truly enhance operations and build better customer relationships? So at the outset, I think uh, when you replay the last two years or two and a half years, you know, since the pandemic, mm -hmm. 
I think the biggest learning at our end as an organization and at a personal level, professional level is the biggest change has actually happened in the mind because you wouldn't have believed that there could ever have been a situation where you would work from home and yes. financial services and especially the piece where I come in, you know, which I, what we represent, which is the capital market space is very complex and you're dealing with transactions, which are, you know, whether, where the latency is measured in milliseconds and nanoseconds actually. Absolutely. To be able to deliver the entire experience, to keep the entire, you know, the shop working. And mm -hmm. the, the financial services space didn't get any uh, respite. I mean, we were called as essential services. Banks were on, the stock exchanges were on. We yes. just learned to work in a new normal where the dealers would work from home or the staff would not come to office. And mm -hmm. you need to manage your entire infrastructure remotely. And that itself brought in a lot of new challenges of how do you manage data security? How do you ensure risk management is still done well? And uh, how do you still keep the workforce motivated, keep them inspired, keep them collaborating with each other? Because really, there wasn't any learning to back up on. There wasn't any example saying, you know, this is something that happened 10 years ago. And yeah. this is how it's managed then. This was new for all of us. So, I mean, those are really, I think, the, the, the need to adapt I think, and uh, those who have adapted well have survived and have done well. And that mm -hmm. for me has been the biggest learning that if you're able to adapt, you'll do well. It's not about survival, you'll actually thrive very well. So that is number one. I think, I think the learning also from a technology point of view is that if you're slightly ahead of the curve, you don't need mm -hmm. to be too ahead of the curve, but even if you're slightly ahead of the curve, in terms of your vision of what you think the future holds for you, you should do fairly well. We were able to transition very easily to the new normal. And mind right. you, we had about, about 1,200 dealers, you know, to automatically make sure all of them had laptops, the right infrastructure, mm -hmm. making sure your laptops were hardened, getting your connectivity yeah. to all of them. Uh, it was a big challenge. But you, if you, you know, thought a little ahead of time, you'll do well. I think in terms of emerging technologies, it's really not about the technology. It's really in terms of theme. Uh, right. Digital transformation was always there. I mean, we've just given it a nice new name or we refer to it now, you know, in a common way. It just mm -hmm. got accelerated, some partly because of, uh, you know, necessity. Uh, in the pandemic, now all of a sudden you realize uh, you couldn't visit the customer's house or the customer didn't want you to visit, you know. Yes. But they were very comfortable uh, doing an e-sign or doing, you know, any alternative way. So the adoption of digital uh, was very fast. I mean, by necessity, we had to adapt very quickly because there was no choice. We still had to keep the wheels and the engines running. Absolutely. But uh, the pandemic just created an ecosystem where everyone was very willing to adopt and something that would have probably taken three years, four years in this country to become the mainstream. It just mm -hmm. happened in three, four months. And that, I think, has been the biggest change that is there uh, in India uh, because of the pandemic. So in a nutshell, I mean, there are a lot of learnings, the emergence of new technologies, what fintechs are bringing to the table, the way they're using AI, ML in new ways that, you know, people couldn't even imagine uh, the way you're doing risk management uh, today in a distributed environment. All these things are there which are here to stay and they will make a huge difference to customer experience. Uh, just one last point, I know I may have exceeded my time, but I think it's an important no. point. One mm -hmm. thing that because the adoption to digital in all you know aspects, not just in finance, what happened is that the benchmarking of customer experience started happening. Now people were not benchmarking their experience on our mobile application to another sure. mobile application, to another stock trading application. They wanted mm -hmm. to see that if I can do this on Amazon, if I can do this on Facebook, if I can do something as easily and on another, you know, e-commerce website, why can't I do it as easily like that on the app? So the customer Perfect. expectations also changed very quickly because of that. And it's a good thing because all the changes for the better role. Definitely. Keeping pace for the consumer expectations, as you pointed out, is very, very crucial. And definitely digital transformation has been on the back foot for many organizations, but the pandemic, pandemic left us with no choice there. A very important points uh, made by you, Mr. Riyaz. Thank you for that. Uh, coming to you, Mr. Swami, what's your insight here? 
what were your key learnings and what are the key technologies that you feel have the potential to transform the entire sector so i i'll just take a lead from uh, the previous speaker i think the crisis has precipitated change which many of us has held on as probably a bit of an inertia to change i think the the previous one probably a milder one in the country was the demonetization that's the other thing that we went through i think these two events have a club together which is really accelerated and jump started the digital adoption and obviously off the start was around collaboration that was the first main thing to that everybody overnight switched to uh, collaborative platforms for an organization of our size with 15000 employees in a, in in a far reaching areas into rural places we have present over 700 branches in 22 states i think uh, it's about the education of the last mile employee who in turn is connecting with the last mile customer to buy into this concept to say things can be done digitally and as i rightly pointed out earlier i think uh, you know customers kept their distance as well and in this environment people were also mind you and i'll bring the people's perspective and the mindset here people were also scared uh I, and i think they were scared for their lives we had 23 deaths in this company um uh, in the second wave so you are talking about people who are petrified of stepping out people who have you know new one way of doing things yeah. and then the whole digital boon was a complete boon in that sense to actually um you know uh, how easy it has made lives of people and of course what were the preset notions of how customers would behave totally changed because the customers adopted very very quickly the second thing which came to the fore was the ability to forge partnerships and alliances and right. i think it was all uh, it was it was one versus the other it was now the the formula changed to one plus the other and where you could you know work with the fintech partners we would work with kirana stores we would work with alternative workforces and all of that was stitched together uh with with very strong collaborative technology mm-hmm. and the last thing i would say before i pause this on is that people the smarter people uh, we weren't one of them were actually used this opportunity to invest fairly heavily in technology because they saw it coming to say this has now changed the landscape once and for all it was not as if people things were going to revert back to the original state but the real benefits coming out of the newer methods of working and i think the amount of effort that went into training the amount of effort that went into um, digital and technology uh, capex during this period was has been significantly higher than ever before in some of the companies that i'm aware of and staff went through went through a lot of training in terms of adoption to these newer tools and of course the reliance on data uh, mm-hmm. which actually focuses people towards you know very specific actions rather than just spreading out in the streets so data and analytics became very 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 uh, important for us and we used this opportunity to internationally also leverage of talent because this actually brought brought the world together i think the the location of people didn't matter anymore and we realized that you know if we were struggling to to uh, you know come to terms with interacting with our own employees in the far flung areas of the country we were also seeing that it the international experts were becoming more accessible as well because i i you know the pandemic affected the globe so i think the the as i said collaboration partnership increased awareness mm-hmm. and challenging your own previous paradigm has been real real learning during this time and you know and and we do hope and pray that some of the old habits don't come back with that i'll pass it back to you Yes, thank you so much for that. Very uh, important learnings uh, shared by you over there. And I would like to pick up from your point: uh, the last mile consumer and the last mile employee are very crucial in determining the success of the company. So, coming to you, Mr. Dallas, uh, with technology, economy, and the current market conditions, people also need to evolve. Organizations need to measure the value of talent itself in new ways. So, what is your insight here? How can we really create a synchronized platform between tech talent and transformation and what are the key technologies that that can help us do that really so uh, i think some wonderful points uh, that some of my, some of my other co-panelists made maybe i'll just add a couple of lines more um, and this is a little bit on and i'm i'm speaking here more as a consumer right uh, you know 
the way I have interacted with the bank has transformed drastically. Right? Uh, mm -hmm. And there was some stat, we did a study recently for the banking sector. And we found that about 54% of the people uh, actually mentioned that their interactions were far more digital than they were pre-pandemic. And I think all of us, our own behaviors would actually reflect that in the way we have interacted with any financial institution, it be a bank, an insurer, or or an NBFC. Right? Our interactions have become fairly digital in nature. So that's that's on the consumer side. As a result, what the, the other aspect of the behavioral change that we are seeing is that the consumers are also willing to share a lot more information about themselves mm -hmm. than before, right? So we're starting to see a new trend where if, if a consumer is given an incremental service is a more personalized service, he is willing to share and part with information with whoever the stakeholder that is dealing with, if they are able to a, secure the data, but at the same time, use the data in a way he gets he feels it as a service right so we we feel these are the two additional things that uh, i just wanted to add in addition to the points around you know all the transformation and technology uh, i think swami made a wonderful point around uh, collaboration right um, i recently read a report where where i think it was uh, jpmc ceo uh, who spoke about the fact that the big tech companies are bigger threat to banks than the than other banking peers uh, themselves, right? He spoke about Google, Facebook as players who are an Amazon who are getting into the payment ecosystem and thereby getting into the financial ecosystem in a larger way, and with their ability to cons you know resource the data, manage the data, and to leverage tech, which is where their origin is. You know, their ability to compete can become substantially higher. Now, at the same time, uh, this this could be a threat. This is also an opportunity for partnership. We are starting to see now, you know, uh, some of the largest financial institutions starting to partner with these big tech players right, in the context of how they can work together in these areas. So I think that Swami made a wonderful point around this collaboration coming in. Right? Now, coming to people's side, right? Uh, we see two dimensions around how people have evolved and what are the new things that they needed to learn right some of them were something as simple as uh, you know learning a new technology or a new tool uh, in the context of the new redefinition of the work or the role that they're doing right companies have adopted new tools the roles have got redefined by virtue of the fact that how consumers have started engaging have changed so that is getting some redefinition of new skills soft skills around how do you manage a remote meeting how do you speak to a customer in a remote environment right uh, how do you create a personal relationship in a, in a remote uh, environment? And on employee side, it's about remote managing your workforce, right? Um, the context you just spoke about last mile employee and the last mile customer. But in that context, the remote working and remote managing is also a new uh, area that is coming. So that's that's one type of skills that we see. And we are calling these as human skills. And we are seeing an evolution and higher consumption in the banking sector around building these newer human skills, right? Be it critical thinking, problem solving, mindfulness, remote working, these are some things that we see. The more obvious ones are clearer ones, which are the need to accelerate skilling in the banking sector and on mm -hmm. emerging tech areas, be it AI, be it uh, big data, be it cloud, right? be it crypto, right? So you, you have so many new areas that are coming in and those are getting disrupted by players who origin either in technology and technology by virtue of democratization anyone can have access to the you know the most complex set of technologies and hence innovate and disrupt a banking player so we are starting to see banks putting a lot more focus on their core digital skills right there are of course functional skills uh, the knowledge of the market all product knowledge they exist but these are two areas where i think we're starting new trend where we see banks trying to build a lot more human skills in the new world of how customers where customers are and technology skills that help them support that. All right. Great. Thank you, Mr. Dallas. Um, coming back to you, uh, Mr. Diaz, an organization success, as uh, Mr. Dallas also mentioned, depends on how well the teams are really equipped in the ability to lead the change. So in your organization, how have you reimagined uh, the teams or re-envisioned the people's operations given the new requirement or, as you mentioned, to survive in the new normal? So we looked at it in we look at it in two ways. So one is 
first of all i think mentally acknowledging the fact that a work from home a permanent work from home or a hybrid model mm-hmm. is here to stay uh, what has changed is uh, the staffing mindset has also changed the, the mindset of people has changed something that they didn't believe was possible okay. now they believe it's not just possible but that is what so in the first 3 months of the pandemic Mm-hmm. uh we had really funny stories because we thought that women would be very happy to work from home you know given the situation in india and they can take care of the kids and all but they, they were the ones had... who wanted to come back <laughs> yeah they were the ones who wanted to come back to office because they said that you know what when i'm at home then my mother in law wants me to make tea for me and she wants me to do all of the stuff which otherwise she would do on their own but nevertheless i mean even where i mean where i come from i am a bombay centric person and my teams are all in bombay largely in bombay if you know the commutes in bombay is very difficult for people to travel most of the people who are from technology or from operations come from the suburbs yes and uh, they would end up spending about anywhere between 3 to 3 and a half uh, hours every day just in the commute and the commute itself is not very pleasant mm-hmm. so what we realized is that a lot of people were okay to work for a couple of hours more if we were okay to let them work from home and not come to office and that's really the philosophy that we've adopted we're okay with a hybrid model what we do instead on is that if you're having the review meetings whatever they be weekly fortnightly or at whatever you know frequency they help or ideation meetings this we insist for people to come on uh, this because what we realize is that while you can do a teams call and you can discuss ideas on teams but uh, the collaborative effect of somebody being in a room together uh, when that's you can draw on a whiteboard and you can ideate and you can do all of that especially in the bsfi space uh, in the space that i come from so sure for the banking sector itself where there is a lot of demand for now design thinking to understand customer issues and try to solve them in a real world way yeah. so for those kind of activities we we call them to office there obviously the hr has taken a lot of initiatives in terms of motivating people inspiring them conducting mm-hmm. sessions for them to you know for mental health people get depressed because they're at home for such a long period of time or learning uh, you know getting them to uh, uh you know learn softer skills uh like interacting with clients or taking meetings online so i think a, a lot of companies have done that if we've done that as well all right so yeah a lot of stuff like that we've done and that is i think going to continue it's not going to i i do, personally don't envisage a world where i expect 100% attendance back to office the mindset is not there at least in the technology world it's not there definitely hybrid is here to stay for sure um coming to you mr rampur uh, what were your learnings here how did you you realign your teams for the new age hybrid working environment and what were the challenges you faced how did you overcome them yeah so continuing from where the other panels have left and very wise thoughts shared so we also had a our fair share of uh, uh, process improvements or gaps that we had uh, realized in the dust to uh, to continue the show uh, running uh, during the pandemic including the work from home or remote working policy which was uh which was never uh, relevant to the banking sector to be very honest and uh, which were never which was never forethought uh, previously that mm-hmm. banks also could uh, actually run uh, from remote that was a notion which which uh, would uh, send shivers in the uh, operational risk departments the info security departments and the top management of the bank so since the pandemic was there and there were a lot of policy uh, reviews and reformulations to help achieve the stated goals and with short shortage on the resources or uh, the existing staff also falling down and uh, we had to abide by the protocols of uh, uh, covid which government agencies had uh, uh, sent from time to time including the social distancing and those kind so so basically it involved all kind of uh, segregation of duties uh, segregation of work forces uh, uh, considering the uh, shortage of uh, space 
and uh, other uh, logistic constraints that we had. Uh, so we divided in multiple batches, uh, the, ro the daily roster, the weekly roster plans, and since being bank, the, the maintenance activities or the support functions had to continuously uh, run round the clock and even on weekends or month ends for all kind of uh, end of the day or end of month activities. So we had to uh, plan accordingly and majority of the times the plans were kind of, uh, there was always a, a plan B or plan C, which was, which had to be executed at the last hour because of the very reason that the original plan that we would have foretold did not uh, work so well because of uh, continuously the people getting uh, infected and the available pool of resources or the, the expertise which was supposed to be there at a particular point in time was not there because uh, of all these reasons right so there was always a contingency plan to be uh, executed and that is where the majority of the learnings had mm -hmm. come into fore. Uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, all the uh, system partners, whether it is banks, hospitals, or uh, judiciary, or uh, the administration departments, everyone kind of worked round the clock, effectively, I would say. So that was the, uh, I mean, if you think about the traffic police, uh, right? They, if, if I talk about uh, uh, the Mumbai traffic police, if I if I'm not uh, mistaken on the numbers, I think at one uh, day, 562 uh, traffic policemen of in uh, of Mumbai got infected, mm -hmm. and many of those were kind of uh, uh, subjected to very stress conditions, right? Because the right. because being the essential services sector, the the hospitals or the banks or any such uh, offices were kept open and there was a lot of uh, due, because of due diligence there was a lot of uh, rush on the roads right and there was a lot of congestion because of the due diligence to be played on the part of these uh, administrative authorities and likewise it was so in banks also and that's where the plan had to be executed uh, to the perfection within the constraints of the the environment or the atmosphere so that was the biggest learning and and someone pointed out very aptly that the morale of the employees had to be kept, to be kept because yeah. there was a, a sense of fear there was a sense of, uh, of irreparable loss right which had to be uh, empathized with and which had to be so all organizations came up with the several employee uh, benefit policies uh, from time to time to encourage their participation regardless of what was happening and at the same time remain sensitive to the to the employees welfare and uh, their families and all so uh, so we, we try to uh, cope up with the with the unprecedented situation that we have at hand Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rampur. Uh, Mr. Swami, Ruchira, would you like to add something here? Yes. Ruchira, I'd like to come in here for a moment. You know, I just want to add, I think, what has happened because of this entire change, and this is here to stay, and I think it's a very positive thing that's happened. Mm -hmm. I think at the operations, people who manage operations have suddenly, you know, during this pandemic, just suddenly realized and had a lot more appreciation for technology and the effort that they have learned uh, the take the, the effort that they have taken to learn technology or how they can uh, you know uh, how they can apply it in their day-to-day -day lives that appreciation has really gone out like in our organization my operations mm -hmm. people have now become half techies yeah and at the and same time the techies also because of you know the rapid change they've mm -hmm. also come up the curve in terms of understanding business they are now functionally far more you know valuable to us as opposed to just knowing technology mm -hmm. so that is something that is a big change that's happened i think definitely in, in and as you mentioned a positive change Great. yeah absolutely and i'd like to come to mr dallas but mr swami i was trying to ask you uh, anything that you'd like to add here how did yeah. you only two, only two things 
yeah yes. only two things i think i think one of the uh, uh, one of the unlearning we have to do and uh, which is very interesting is is how to market tendons i think uh, okay. that was a that was a skill that was best forgotten and uh, we have adopted to new ways and there again technology played a very big lar large part in the, you know marking attendance from the traditional way to actually how you do today and the second point i wanted to make quickly before we pass it on is actually the issue was not so much sending people home during the pandemic i think because that was thrust upon us the issue was when you brought them back to work and when you brought them brought them back to work you brought, bring them back to the previous universe they knew or you bringing them back with some learnings that has ingrained for keeps in people and and that is where this now uh, more voluntarily working remotely and working more collaboratively in, the, in you know without having to huddle together is the mindset shift that people have now come to realize and understand some are even demanding that so we have left it very freely open instead of binding them with a policy and rostering to actually let people decide for themselves very very important Prashika, just, point. flexibility is very important and so is the, yes fluidity yeah. and being open to employee requirements but go on yeah. uh, Prashika, to, to your point uh, i just wanted to add two points on talent sure. and the flexibility and i'll, I'll give an example for us uh, we were pre pandemic uh, we were about 20 people and we are now over 200 uh, in india sure. right wow. now one of the context is right in the and most of the hiring happened during uh, you know the lockdowns and uh, in the in a virtual way uh, and for us culturally that the, there was a big unlearning as a company that we were a very office first company right? we as a company that was our culture that's how we were our ceo believed in that model but during what during the pandemic is when we realized a lot of our work all the way from instructional design to you know building out the platform to the tech aspects to the right. customer engagement and learner engagement aspects all of that can actually be delivered virtually oh. so we actually flipped completely right, uh, right. and and in our ability to scale from the 20 to 200 one of the mm -hmm. biggest flexibility that we have is that we could hire talent anywhere irrespective of where they were based and that okay. made a huge difference in the context of availability of technology talent and other talent, Definitely. higher quality talent, but in respect without being restricted by where they were. Right. So right. today in India, we have about 27 people sitting in 27 cities. Uh, you know, these 200 people that we the second part is the second one. The second one is we are seeing a trend where there are certain category of jobs mm -hmm. which have kind of become more remote first, right? There are certain jobs which will potentially remain in the office, but mm -hmm. there are certain jobs which are hitherto not enabled, not remote first in that category. But a lot of those jobs have started to move to a remote first scenario. And as sure. they become remote first, you have the ability to actually globalize your workforce depending on where you want to be, right? Uh, and at the the other interesting stat here was that these remote first work that we had were actually the higher uh, paying wage, you know, the higher wage jobs, hmm. uh, a set of them were the ones who could actually be delivered remote, right? So you can imagine they imagine how this can impact the context of availability of where the talent is and sure. the fact that these these new job these earlier jobs that were earlier not imagined to be remote first could be done anywhere in the world. Right? Definitely. Mr. Dallas, I'd like to uh, actually come back to you because I wanted to discuss uh, the most important aspect here, which is of upskilling. So how can uh, new skill sets be actually uh, inculcated in our employees and how can organizations really enable employees with the right skills and the right tools? And how are you at Coursera enabling that? Really? Sure. So I'll, first, let me start with a little bit around the frameworks that we see out uh, as we work with clients across the world. Um, mm -hmm. As with most functions, learning was one function which, uh, you know, learning, skilling, upskilling, whether it was an upskill or a reskill, both these roles actually moved virtually, you know, in a very, very uh, big way, right? So mm -hmm. uh, our sector was potentially one of the big beneficiaries of uh, the pandemic and the digital transformation that followed around. Right? Sure. Now, uh, we found as, but at the same time, the maturity of various industries, maturity of various employee uh, workforces, and maturity of organizations' own culture 
determine what kind of learning frameworks post organize some organizations adopted and some adopted and other ones right so we we now see three distinct patterns we see one pattern where the while upskill reskill is a very important mission for the organization mm -hmm. uh, and there are capability and role based definitions etc that are aligned to it but the learning approach because the maturity levels are low they leave it to the employee so they create a platform create bring all the resources that are required and you know and the concept we talk about is more like an open learning right you leave it to the employee give him let him go and you know uh, put the lake out there and let the horse go and drink it right so so that's yeah. the that's the belief we call that more open learning uh, uh, the second one we started was we, we see where sectors which are getting disrupted more faster industries which are getting disrupted more faster and hence they had to move a little more aggressively in certain areas especially in tech areas they started picking a guided approach which means you know as an organization as a bank i realized that data science is becoming more critical in the way my marketing will operate and hence i need to build out a very strong data science function in my marketing right, right? Mm -hmm. so they they started taking a very guided approach and putting a you know mandate that these people need to be skilled whether it is an upskill or a reskill depending on where that individual certain individual sits mm -hmm. and they pushed a mandate we, and we used to we we call that a guided learning approach right so where people are so you measure okay how many people have i certified in data science how many people have i certified in digital marketing how many people have i certified in cyber security because these are new things that suddenly yes. have hit an acceleration uh, in the data transformation but the one where companies who have been fairly mature uh, you know learning strategies as well as in their ability to define role and skills much deeply mm -hmm. are the ones where we have seen uh, the learners being able to curate their learning journeys around their individual uh, skills, right? So the, right. one of the core requirements is that you you have a definition of roles and you have a, uh, for those roles you have a definition of key skills that will make you successful, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for example, a digital marketer, I would say, while he needs to have marketing knowledge, one of some of the new skills that are required is uh, data visualization skills. He needs to have a data analysis skills. Right? And then there are some tool-based skills. There are a few new skills that have come in for a digital marketer that are critical. Now, the important thing is every one of us, even in the same team doing the same roles, may have very different skills, right? I have a background in tech and I might have much better data uh, uh, skills, but my uh, creative areas or something is where I need probably more learning, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea was here was to give the learner the power to know where he sits. Uh, sure. So people can take self-assessments they can see where they stand companies have the ability to define standards and say if you are in this role this is the minimum level of skill sets that you require in that scenario we found the learner adoption of learning to become far more effective as high as by 75 percent right where you have where you give them a visibility to where they stand what they need to yeah. be where they need to be so that improves a uh, uh, skilling pattern. The second one was even in talent mobility, right? One of the core things is people always demand growth, but sure. are they ready for the next next few next two roles that they can that they need to operate uh, function? In those two areas, they can actually transparently see the skills that are required, the levels that they need to do, and yes. then an ability to curate their learning in Close the context that. of their own personal growth. So that impacts talent mobility. So so finally, all of this leads to better you know, lower attrition, better satisfaction, and an employee having more transparency in what they need to do. So we call that skills first learning, and that's that's probably where, you know, the overall sector is moving in how learning is going to be enabled. Definitely. Well, very uh, pertinent points there made by you, sir. Um, coming to you, uh, Mr. Rankul, new skill sets, uh, as Mr. Dallas also mentioned, are in demand. The BFI se sector is investing heavily into these uh, new skill sets, enabling their employees. So how did you really achieve that uh, at your organization? When I say high value, those are having a uh, greater value to the end user experience. I mean by that. Mm -hmm. So sure. uh, how you can uh, uh, improve the engagement of the end customers. So mm -hmm. whatever it takes to enrich that experience, those are high value by definition. So how to enrich that experience, whatever is uh, uh, required uh, to improve uh, that value chain becomes the focus area of uh, engagement. Now, having said that, uh, 
whether it requires the in-app analytics to get the customer feedback or uh, to to give that extra mile or the leverage to the customers in the special conditions right so all that was prioritized and those required a uh, kind of upskilling cross upskilling everything all right so because everything right from the uh, what say the regular banking services or financial right. services to the maybe uh, to the uh, first aid uh, medicine or first aid box or basic medicines right or basic uh, necessities right uh, like uh, plumbing electrician etc etc right all those got tagged with the uh, within the umbrella of uh, regular banking services uh, which sure. generally uh, in a nutshell banks try to provide and a lot of aggregators also try to provide uh, mr riaz i'd like to come to you here how are you uh, you know what are the initiatives that you are taking at your organization to bring in greater agility to your business and how are you empowering your employees with the right skills so i'll be very honest with you actually the last two years in the pandemic if you look at it the sectors that we operate in no these sectors have done very well mm -hmm. uh, we've seen record number of volumes record uh, number of transactions and coupled with what's happening in the technology industry from a people from a talent point of view mm -hmm. so to be very honest uh, most of the trainings and upskilling that we have done is really on the job itself it's really right. now when things have settled a little bit where we're mm -hmm. looking at a more structured approach which is there but okay. uh, even in a even in a see when you're looking at corporate technology you know it's not about upskilling the entire workforce because there are standard technologies where you will keep on getting talent and then they'll keep on learning new stuff uh, in terms of what you're doing but there are specific sectors where the technology is genuinely cutting edge say for example trading technologies sure. where there's constant evolution where the race is to go down to 0 milliseconds in terms of executing an order or in terms of uh, managing scale to be able to do say uh, one crore or two crore transactions in a minute, in a manner of minutes you know mm -hmm. so in those kind of very specific there we do very structured trainings we do a lot of upskilling reselling or all of those things which are there but right. uh, otherwise business has been so good there's very little time for uh, you know to spend adequate as much as what we would have liked Uh, right. Yeah. Great, but that, that's. Rishra, maybe Rishra, on that context, yes. I just wanted to add to one of the points that uh, Riaz yes. mentioned. Um, sure. So while upskill, reskill is something which is more around deep skilling, uh, one of the newer paradigms that we start that we talk about is now learning in the flow of work, which right. is you know uh, you are in the process of doing something like in a let's say Riaz's scenario, people have picked up a new project because suddenly new issues have come up and some new projects have to be picked up, and then you need to quickly pick up new skills or new knowledge which are more how to right? How do I do this? How do I connect my React to a MongoDB right? Something that could be as simple yeah, as that yeah. in a technology term. So and these don't require you to go through you know a deep upskilling, reskilling program. around that because they are typically in learning the flow of work they know some concept but they don't know certain things in the context of doing the job that they have so we are seeing this new concept around learning the flow of work which is about how can you serve the right content and the right learning tool to that learner in the context of the work he is doing right and these these which is where the entire concept of nano credentials and nano learning and micro learning as emerged mm -hmm. right where you want to pick up something to learn in 5 minutes 10 minutes 15 minutes but those are more the learning the flow work it won't lead to deep skilling it won't lead to capability building but it will solve your learning in the flow work problem so that's that's one one thing that you have noticed all right yeah that's that's brilliant yeah prashant yeah and i, I right. think to be honest that's probably the way how things actually happen it's likely yeah. that when the developer is stuck with something and needs help with the core then he just turns around is going to google or is going to github or is going to some other place or mm -hmm. just turning around and asking his colleagues or his manager and they spend probably 15 20 minutes half an hour you know uh, looking at the code rewriting it learning something new and then right. going ahead and executing it correct yeah so so the context is you know the way we are seeing is that you do that and there will be always people who say you know what this is i love this place and i want to pick something more so you you 
give them the path where you know I learned this something small, right? Mm-hmm. Now I have I have I have figured out a great interest in building out a new skill, a uh, new uh, area of uh, reskill or an upskill for myself for a new role in the future, and I want to go deeper into it, right? So yeah. how do you make that seamless, right? I learned this, make that seamless. He goes into a deeper course, learns mm-hmm. all the way, and then becomes a more valuable resource to the company, right? Learn in the flow of work, and then at the same time allow that path to a reskill or an upskill journey. Definitely, and organizations are constantly reevaluating re- re- the skill sets of the employees Absolutely. to keep up with changing tech trends. Uh, Mr. Swami, uh, what is your insight here? Any learnings that you'd like to share? I think with us? we've just uh, fueled and unlocked the curiosity for people to learn, other than orchestrated sessions around agile and uh, you know because of so much of a digital uh, invasion uh, work around cybersecurity. But more importantly, I think we've made people aware uh, about a lot of things to say you know the biggest digital evolution has happened by the government actually. If you look at the national account aggregator kind of program, which is the NSDL e-governance, the national digital infrastructure that's been created, many companies mm-hmm. had gone around doing bipartite kind of uh, you know uh, data sharing. But then you see that the government's created a highway, and that awareness, unlocking that awareness is big, and and this is really going to change the way people kind of look at data and consume data. The second and, and the most latest soundbite, which is going around town, which we are running awareness sessions on knowledge adda, as we call it internally, mm-hmm. is this whole thing around meta and metaverse. Yes. Um, and and that's so fascinating. And uh, you know, we are we are thinking where all can it take us to in terms of even selling to customers or even even uh, running training courses, uh, simulators. So this these. These are, these are really fascinating things which we are creating awareness in, in the mindset of people and it's really the young management trainee who will come up with a smart idea which we, I'm sure we will leverage and commercialize it. Definitely. That's true. It is the millennials who are going to be leading this whole chain about talent, tech and transformation. But just before we wrap up on this discussion, uh, just two quick questions to all of you. Uh, it's very crucial to also measure the business impact of all these learning initiatives and while upskilling and reskilling is very important, what are the metrics that you have been deploying to gauge the success of these programs? So we could start with you, uh, Mr. Riaz. Any particular so metrics? For us, see, uh, see, for us, to be very honest, uh, at Edelweiss, the theme largely for us, given what is happening for us in our industry, the theme really is about automation, scale, the effectiveness of the automation. So scale is directly measured in terms of number of transactions, units of transactions that you are doing. And right. uh, in most of those metrics, we would have at least quadrupled in the last 12 months. Great. The second Great. is also we did a very deep exercise along with an external partner to actually assess the robustness of the enterprise in terms of how many operations are being done manually, how much are being done in an automated mm-hmm. manner. Mm-hmm. And given the sensitivity with regulation, how much of our submissions to the regulators, internal auditors, etc. actually happens through an automated route. And after completing that assessment, so there is a metric for us. So there's obviously a plan to go from X to Y over the next six months Mm -hmm. uh, for us to be able to reach a certain level of threshold that we would be very comfortable with, even if it's not 100% automation. The third is obviously in terms of customer experience, the biggest metric across all Mm -hmm. our uh, shops is NPS. We use NPS as a very uh, deep tool uh, right. Our RMs are measured on it. Our technology teams are measured on it, mm-hmm. and uh, I mean that's the honest truth. It's what the customer actually says. Whether he's a, you know, he's a promoter, he's a detractor, he's just passive. So that is something that we use very, very effectively and very seriously okay. at Device. Great, Mr. Ankur, uh, would you like to share your insight here? Yeah. So the. The success criteria for any initiative, existing or new, uh, as an outcome of reskilling or upskilling of employees, is the is the escalation in the volumes and the reduction in the complaints or the transaction declines, as we call them. So those parameters will measure the success outcomes of any initiative and how much the uh, how much beneficial was the training program or any kind of a new uh, introduction of technology or any new 
proof of concept had been uh, so those are the two or three different only th those are the kpis basically to be observed all right great and uh, mr swami what is your insight here how have you been measuring the impact of all these learning initiatives while you focus on upskilling and reskilling your employees so we've taken a view that ultimately whatever be the learnings would need to translate into business outcomes and mm -hmm. uh, you know if we are looking at measuring employee productivity they, because we are a we are a lending company uh, the number of units that or volume the person does per person uh, has because of technology intervention or or raised awareness of the employee whatever be the cause but this should be the end result and effect from a customer standpoint the turnaround time is is very important if you've had any technology intervention as well as smarter way of doing things that should ultimately benefit the customer then improved that and of course uh, of late as i said it's a it's a world of partnerships so the speed at which you can onboard uh, partners and run those customer journeys and sprints, as we call it, in, in faster time. Right. That those are the things which are clear measures of outcome of tangible outcome of training programs. Definitely, great. So just before we wrap up, one last question to each one of you. Um, we talked about the importance of skilling, reskilling, learning, and unlearning, and even new learnings. But going forward, how can the BFSI sector leverage tech and talent to sustain a heightened performance? over the long term. So, uh, Mr. Dallas, any winning strategies here that you'd like to share with us and our audience? Yeah, let me let me actually summarize this in a simple way. Um, you know, the pace of change that we see today is probably going to be the slowest that it will ever be. Right? Uh, it is only going to increase a lot more. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of that pace of change we will always see that has an element of technology coming in in the context of how some of these changes are happening. Be it on the technology side and the social side, these are the two areas where we see most of the uh, changes that are coming in. Mm -hmm. What that will do in the future is we we foresee that the jobs will keep getting altered. And one of the, one of the uh, studies that I read recently said about 60% of the jobs will get altered, right? We talk about jobs getting replaced by automation, right? Some of the work that, you know, Riaz was talking about how, you know, he's looking at his processes and the context of how many job you know, processes can be automated. So jobs will go away and machines will take over. So many repeatable jobs will get automated. It will get replaced. But more importantly, there will be many jobs which are getting redefined in the context of how those roles are evolving. And a lot of them to do with either a social change or a technological change, right? All of this will lead to one thing which will be very important in the context of an employee and an organization will be their ability to create that learning quotient in the organization to a point where, you know, if, if I have to be more provocative, I'll say the future of success of an organization will depend a lot more around what learning, how learning uh, is that organization, right? The future of work could be defined as learning in the future in the context of all the changes that will come in. All right. Great. Uh, Mr. Ankur, uh, any winning strategies that you'd like to share on how you think the BFSI sector can leverage tech and talent and stay ahead and uh, stay agile? So, um, we can continue to develop our uh, task force uh, by mm -hmm. enabling them to pick up certain new technologies of relevance. We can, uh, uh, we can motivate them to pick up uh, new technologies uh, and convert it to tangible outcomes. One, we can uh, motivate them to use the existing system better mm -hmm. and fill yes. up the gap, whether those are operational gaps and try to uh, try to address the customer pain points because that is how the businesses are driven. So largely, if we follow these uh, basic principles, I think uh, those will form the strategy for many more years to come. And, uh, and of course, the learning that we had uh, during the pandemic, I uh, think uh, bring all those learnings into the play. And that's how I work. I connect at this level. Great. Great, thank you. Uh, just last closing comments from Mr. Riaz and Mr. Swami. What are your winning mantras for the BFSI sector and the new fintechs? 
Yeah. Okay. So I was just going to say it in a in a short way to say a winning strategy for for any one of us. I'm sure all of us would agree is is a strategy that wins the customer over, right? So mm-hmm. I think uh, uh, that that's all our activities are underpinning that whole strategy and deep insights, building deep insights into customer changing customer behavior is very important. Yes. And we're investing heavily in decision data and decision sciences behind that. I think that's that's going to be our at least from a lending company standpoint is going to be our key formula for for growth and All right. success. Yes, Mr. Riaz, tell us your winning strategies or winning mantra for you. I concur completely with what Swami says. I think uh, this mantra for success is understanding the customer better and. Mm-hmm. Uh, using all the technology that's either available in house or through collaboration with fintechs or anywhere else that's available in the world to deliver the mm-hmm. best experience to customers because that's really when they are going to stick around with you and statistically when customers stick around you with for you with longer then that's when your company really makes a lot of money and that's good for everyone that's a win-win situation for everyone so that's really your winning mantra understand the customer better deliver mm-hmm. solutions that are impacting his life Great. So better customer relationships, better uh, and more enhanced customer experiences. So thank you so much, gentlemen, for sharing your insights here on how to effectively scale up the digital operations in the BFSI sector. So thank you for sharing our insights. And thank you so much to our audience for watching this very special show.